Um, and I'm again delighted to welcome, um, uh, in this case, two speakers, Professors uh, Elizabeth Stone and Paul Szymanski, um, Emeritus Professors from Stony Brook University. And um, uh, I think when I disappear from the screen, we'll be able to see both of them, which will be great. There we are. Uh, <laughs> um, perfect. Um, and look forward very much to, to your talk. Thank you so much for being with us today uh, on the Ur 3 to Early Old Babylonian Transition. So um, we will see now if we can get your presentation up. Perfect. Thank you very much. There's not much dispute that Southern Mesopotamia saw a major political transition at the end of the third millennium BC. Soon after the centralized and bureaucratic empire controlled by the kings of the third dynasty of Ur gave way to a shifting hegemonies of city-states under the dynasties of Issa and Lhasa, the authors of the lamentation over the destruction of Sumer and Ur mourned that, quote, Ur, like a city raked by a hoe, is to be counted as a ruined mound. And, quote, in Ur, people were smashed as if they were clay pots, close quote. Poetry and political elites aside, there are certainly some puzzling disjunctures in the archaeology of Ur itself. In the third millennium, almost all of the known structures are public buildings, and no Ur three private houses have been excavated. But in the early second millennium, private houses abound. The written record of the third millennium um, is rather is largely um, administrative texts, whereas private documents, including letters, appear in large numbers in the Isinlasa and Old Babylonian periods. On the other hand, there are some grounds for suspecting that these changes at the apex did not penetrate very deeply into the lower levels of society. Material culture is represented by such mundane items as pottery, figurines, and minor arts show a great deal of continuity between the two periods. Could it be that some of the perceived differences are the result of accidents of preservation and archaeological practice? From 2015 to 2019, we conducted excavations at Ur in order to study how the material conditions under which the majority of the urban population lived actually changed between these two periods. In this communication, we will focus on what we learned about the transition itself, which we must own is disappointingly little. We were specifically interested in private houses at Ur and Woolley provided a benchmark for the end of the transition in his extensive excavations of the residential area AH. Woolley implied that Ur 3 levels lay immediately below the Isamasa houses here, but stopped digging before um, he reached them. I quote, for our purpose, it was necessary to get as wide a purview as possible, and therefore the importance of the Lhasa strata having been proved, our course was to extend the area under excavations rather than to prove deeper. In every case, work has, was stopped when we had reached the lowest floor level down to which the ground plane of the building was essentially the same as it had been at the highest floor level, or when we had reached a point at which Lhasa remains, i.e. tablets and datable pottery types, began to be replaced by those of the Third Dynasty. Uh, this is Woolley and Malawan, um, page 14. Um, initially, and in retrospect, somewhat naively, we assumed that the most efficient way to approach the problem was to dig deeper in and around AH, going from the known to the unknown in secure stratigraphic control. We selected two areas where Woolley had already dug, and what remained on the surface after nine decades appeared to offer immediate access to the levels below. It soon became apparent that there was a large amount of well-preserved Isinlasa architecture in these locations. And we were not going to be able to open large horizontal exposures at earlier levels. So we opened two new operations immediately outside of AH, one to the northeast and one to the south. But we must confess that it proved beyond our capacities to uncover the neighborhood of private houses that we were looking for. But let's review what we can say about the result of our efforts. To give the narrative any coherence, we have to approach the transition phase from top down, i.e. in reverse chronological order. Our trenches in one Baker Square and Niche Lane, operators one and two respectively, showed us 
that Woolley le left a lot of it's and loss of material in the ground. Let's start with Operation 1, Room 6. He apparently dug all the way to the pavement, but does not mention um, removing part of it. Um, near where he stopped, we found a tablet dating to Rimson 24 and a copy, copper ring, neither of which were probably in any kind of context. Um, when we removed the rest of the pavement, we discovered that the baked brick walls, baked bricks of the walls rested on somewhat thicker mud brick walls. Since it would hardly make sense to put stronger material over weak ones, they must have been following the plans of earlier buildings. Within the room, we found a badly disturbed cis burial with poor preservation and no grave goods other than pottery. This is no doubt the grave of one of the Isimasa inhabitants of the house. The situation in room seven next door was similar. Woolley apparently dug to the base of the baked brick wall below which was a pavement that had been partially rubbed out. Numerous jar and bowl burials of the Issan Lhasa period were found here, including several for infants. Although it's irrelevant to our inquiry, we cannot resist showing the contents of one of these jar burials, which contained the touching remains of a pair of fraternal twins, male and female, along with a tablet bearing what we assume was the name of his mother, their mother. Um, in the large room, room five, Woolley's plan shows a full pavement and the outline of a vaulted tomb beneath it. We did not find any of the pavement which we assumed he had removed, and here too Woolley did not map the underlying mud brick walls. Initially, we hoped that the tomb, which was architecturally intact, might contain its original inventory. In this, we were disappointed. The robbers had come in from the front of the tomb, not the roof, and Woolley himself must have peered in and recognized the futility of digging further here. In any case, in dismantling the tomb, we learned a good deal about what went into its construction and how thoroughly it disrupted the earlier remains of this area. Its outer sides were covered by a thick layer of bitumen and a reed matting stretched between its sides and the mud brick wall foundations. In the debris of the construction behind the tomb, there were third millennium artifacts, including a copper chisel and an account of, for gold dated to shortly 43. This tablet, incidentally, was baked, as were most of the other Earth 3 tablets found in our excavations, which was not the case for the Issan Lhasa or Babylonian tablets. In some of the debris that was placed in front of the tomb, we found a dozen inscribed Amasin bricks. These are clear evidence that the old Babylonian builders were helping themselves to the remains of Earth 3 construction materials. Room 4 appeared to give us our best shot at uncovering the transition from Earth 3 in this area, but this too was something of a disappointment. Much of the southwest end of the room was taken up by a drain, which was dug down from the Isinasa floor. The mil middle of the room was disturbed by a Larnax burial, richly furnished with carnelian beads and a fine stone bowl of the type associated with Oman, but of course this was irrelevant to our quest. When we reached the levels uh, with Earth 3 pottery in the northwestern end of the room, we were no longer in good architectural context, and there was no clear demarca demarcation from the levels above. The animal bones showed a mixed husbandry with sheep, goat, cattle, and pig throughout. Sheep may have been a little more abundant in Earth 3 deposits, but the volume of material is insufficient to verify this. The plant remains change from almost exclusively barley and earth three to a much broader range of plant remains in the old Babylonian. But once again, this is based on little material and from a somewhat uncertain context. In operation two, we face similar problems in reaching earth three levels. What appeared to be an area where the earlier remains had eroded away, it was anything but. And a good deal of our time went to redigging windblown deposits in areas that Woolley had already uncovered. Um, where we were able to go deeper, we were impressed by the complexity of the rebuildings and complex stratigraphy of the Isinmasa remains. Local populations had continuously rearranged their living quarters. In these tight spaces, we went as deep as we dared in several places. In Woolley's room 2-2, for example, we must have come very close to Earth 3 levels, and indeed among the objects found near the bottom of our trench was another receipt for gold dated to Amasin 8. Our deepest probe 
was in Mitch Lane itself. And here we clearly did get into and indeed through the Earth 3 period. Um, there was not much to it and no destruction level was visible in the bulks, although a small paved area was cut by the top of a drain. About a meter below the level of the pavement, we found a small old Akkadian administrative archive of 18 tablets and fragments. These were economic texts, including accounts of fish and cattle, some listing items with values in silver. One account gave amounts of wool, oil, grain, and clothing. Another recorded the area of fields. Given the small area, there's no architectural context, but these tablets significantly increase what we know about the Akkadian presence or beyond the Royal Cemetery. In short, what our soundings within A showed us was that Woolley did not dig the earlier Isinlasa levels. We found quite a bit of interesting material from them, which we cannot cover here, but merely note that there were burials under the floors of every room we dug. It is clear that Woolley, who stopped at the room pavements, was unaware of their existence. We did not find any significant Earth-3 architectural remains, let alone any houses of that period, nor did we find any destruction levels. It was clear from quite early in the field season that we were not going to be able to open large areas dating to the period we were looking for. So we moved soundings near but outside AH. Um, Operation 4 began as a 10 by 10 meter square located in an area Woolley had excavated and cleared near Babylonian houses, only traces of which remained. The idea was to get a good stratigraphic sequence here from the first to the third millennium. We felt that we were on the verge of re reaching Earth 3 levels when the 2019 season came to a close. As we write, we have not uh, seen, except here, uh, the result of Brad Hafer's re recent excavations, so obviously can't say much about the Earth 3 Isamasa transmission here. What surprised and impressed us was how deep we had to dig. There was quite a bit of soil beneath the Neo Babylonian surface, in which we found no architecture at all, but only occasional horse and rider figurines and pits deep dating to the Kassite period. Beneath this, however, um, was domestic architecture dated to the early second millennium, interspersed with burials. There were enough tablets to show that we were in the very earliest part of the Isin hegemony. Perhaps the most important finding of our watch was that these structures were built on ground that was much lower in terms of absolute elevation than the lowest Isin Lhasa walls in, er, um, um, in nearby AH, as Brad has um, just noted. In short, when the early second millennium people built their houses, AH was already a hill rising a few meters above the contemporary level of, um, of Operation 4. Operation 3 was the most interesting of our excavations. The surface there was reddened with burnt clay and ash, and the walls of one of the more substantial houses of this period excavated anywhere at Ur appeared a few centimeters below the modern surface. Ultimately, we found some of these walls were preserved to a height of two meters. The area was used in the cemetery in later periods, and as we cleared the fill, we encountered a bewildering variety of graves ranging, ranging from brick tombs, bathtubs, and keyhole coffins, simple inhumations, as well as the odd um, cassite pit. In the northern part of the trench, the old Babylonian house was more or less intact, with several of the rooms still fully paved. The bricks of some of the walls had been rubbed out, but the edges of the pavement beside them made it clear where they had been. The house was built around a central courtyard surrounded by one or more rows of rooms. It appears to have been abandoned at the end of the Old Babylonian period, and not many objects were left in situ. An indicator that it stood empty for some time is seen in the survival of the bottom few centimeters of a reed door standing ajar in one of the doorways. There were surprisingly not one, but two staircases leading to a roof or upper story, one of which was so well preserved that we used it regularly to get in and out of the trench. However, the architecture in the northern part of this excavation was so substantial that it impeded access to lower levels. We were neither allowed nor inclined to dismantle the building to dig deeper. When we opened an adjoining trench to the south, things changed rather dramatically. Large parts of the paved area were broken up, presumably by later looters, 
who were interested in the burials beneath. Uh, they created something of a stratigraphic nightmare, but at least some of the Isin Larsen O level burials were untouched. Many were not. Um, and in some places, the pavement disappeared altogether. We made some of our most interesting finds here including this red slip pot, presumably from Bahrain or elsewhere in the Gulf, and an Indus Valley weight. The people buried here clearly had long range connections. The primary feature in this area, clearly covered by the brick paving associated with the old Babylonian house, was a vaulted tomb of the same type as the one we saw in Operation One, albeit somewhat considerably smaller. Its entrance was sealed, but it had been entered by robbers from the top. We found a few bones inside it, but no precious objects, at least none of value to the looters. There were, however, a few old Babylonian tablets. While there has been some speculation about why anyone would put a tablet in a tomb, in this case, we know exactly where they came from. The looters had covered the opening with pithashers when they left, and there were many more tablets of the same archive on top of it and in the soil around. In short, the looters had dug through material above the pit pavement that include the archive, bring some tablets in with them. Yesterday, Dominic Chapin covered this material, so we need not go into the details. This archive presumably belonged to the final owner of the house, a very influential gen general named Abus Bisum, who was active right up to the time of the, that some seemingly lost control of Ur. They give us a nice terminal date for the occupation of the house with its extensive paved courtyards. The disturbance of the soil allowed us to finally open up a larger area to see what came before Abu Sin's house. Um, we had intriguing clues from the disturbed soil there uh, that, that, that there was important um, three material in this area. In an uncertain context in the sub pavement debris, the most beautiful our inscriptions was found a, a broken carnelian pen, pendant with a bearing a text of Shogi. We most certainly did not find anything resembling an R3 house under the old Babylonian pavement. Instead, we found large storage vessels sent into mud brick walls. One of the, these was of particular interest, not just for its nearly spherical shape and red slip finish, but also because it bore a row of scratch marks that appear to be tallies. We really have no idea what was going on here, but these vessels are clearly complete and not very portable. The architecture with which they are associated is anything but clear. Perhaps the most interesting light we were able to sh shed on the Earth 3 period in this era came from a unique tablet found, find immediately below the old Babylonian pavement and on top of a scrap of mud brick wall that probably dates to the end of the third millennium. We found a cake of bitumen that had clearly been formed um, in either slightly conical vessel or a basket. On top of this was a perfectly preserved big tablet. Dominique Chapin informs us that this is a very unusual document of the Earth III period, a contractual exchange, quite large parcels of land between two private individuals. It is dated to the catastrophic reign of Ibi Sin, and it's hard to see how much legal force it would have had after his empire collapsed. Nevertheless, somebody went to a lot of trouble to preserve this tablet, deliberately burying it in a protective container. We removed the vaulted tomb and dug approximately one meter below it, finding remarkably little, certainly nothing that bears on the issue of the transition that we were looking for. We found no tablets or anything that we could confidently say was Earth 3 or Akkadian. The fragments of mud brick walls did not resolve themselves into any coherent plans. We did find a few large vessel fragments, which do not appear to be containers for graves. What appeared at the outset to be a large storage jar with rib sides was only half there, its bottom broken off so it could not have held, held grain or liquids. In any case, it was empty when we found it and basically without context. We found one wall with plano convex bricks and a bit confident that we were in the early dynastic when our last season came to the end in April 2019. So in the end, as we have suggested from time to time in this talk, we do not have we do we do not have much way of positive evidence for the transition between Earth three and Isan Rasa periods in the AH area. Our search for Earth three houses was impeded initially 
by the extent and richness of the Isamas and all Babylonian remains left behind by Woolley. That is not to say that our efforts were unrewarding. When he departed Ur in 1934, Woolley felt that further digging would probably only produce redundant information. That was not our impression as we went below the floors where he stopped. Indeed, the discovery that almost every room had burials below the floor is significant. The housing of IH covered a larger area than was previously expected, and much would be learned by expanded excavations, as the House of Abusum shows. Most of our findings in the Earth 3 Eastern Lhasa transition, however, are essentially negative. There was certainly no destruction level that we could associate with it, and no sharp, sharp breaks in material culture. We turned up a few Earth 3 tablets in every area where we worked, but no archives. Um, one cannot ex escape the feeling that our project may have been a fool er fool's errand to begin with. If we learn anything about the modest areas in which we went below the Isinlasa levels, is that there is no comparable residential housing to be found there in the Earth 3 period. AH is clearly not the place to look for this. We watched with envy as Adelheid Otto and the Munich team found very accessible Earth 3 materials immediately below the Isinlasa house they excavated in the South Mound. But as we are writing our paper, we are informed that these were some apparently something other than a private residence. Now, of course, we just have heard um, the Otto and Einwig Piper, so we may all know more details. If there are no houses in AH, and the one that we thought we had in the South Mound isn't one either, where were the private residences? Perhaps there were very few of them. In publishing our bitumen embedded tablet, Dominique Champin noted the surprising dearth of private Earth 3 documents from Ur in comparison to Nippur, for example. It's been suggested that the Earth 3 kings did not spend much of their time at Ur, and maybe not very many other people did either, apart from those who were associated with the grand institutions. In any case, we personally have given up the hunt and look forward to the discoveries of younger archaeologists who will undoubtedly find marvelous things as they continue to work at Ur begun a century ago. Thank you. Now what happens? Presumably, yes, there we go. I'm let back in to say thank you very much indeed for that, that uh, uh, wonderful um, talk, um, really the detailing, um, well, really extraordinary contribution to our understanding of of or but also you know many of the challenges so thank you indeed there are i think some questions coming in um and, and well um information more than question from uh from Eek. so i hope you can read that i see yes <laughs> We were, so, we were uh, operating uh, off of a draft of that paper. I hadn't realized that it wasn't out yet. <laughs> so we'll be able to add that in. Let me just pause in case um, anyone else in our audience would like to ask a direct question at this point. Otherwise, I'm sure they'll be able to pick up in the chat section. No, nothing, I think. Immediately, so um, I'd just like to thank you again, uh, Elizabeth, Paul, for um, you know, tremendous work and a tremendous paper. Thank you very much indeed for your contribution to the colloquium. <laughs>